welcome. Um, so this talk's called Leading Smart People, and I realise that there's a lot of people here that have already been leaders for quite a while. Um, you might have been leaders in a team, you might be coaches, and while I wrote this talk thinking about people stepping up to leadership for the first time, um, I realised actually there are times in your career, kind of mid-career or even once you're, you're getting quite senior, where you might have to lead a group of people who have once been your peers, um, people who you consider to be smart people. So this actually applies at any point in your career. Um, and a lot of us, our first experience of leadership is as a team leader. And very often the path to becoming the team leader is through being the expert, the people that come to, the person that people come to with their questions, um, the person who's respected because of how much they know about how everything works around here, and the smartest person in the room. And slowly, subtly, subconsciously, we can take on some ideas from that that stay with us for quite a long time about what it means to be a leader. Um, ideas like, I should know all the answers, um, or the team won't respect me if I'm not the expert, or I'll sound stupid if I ask lots of questions, or I'm an imposter here. And all of these things are lies. And that last one about being the imposter, that's the most easily disprovable, because unless it's your first week, you can't be an imposter. Worst case, you're an infiltrator. And that was a really fun thing to say, me talking about my being an infiltrator when I worked in government. Um, but, but I totally am. I started out in desktop support. Um, ooh, I think I'm somewhere between Shelby and Dan in terms of my, um, my tenure in, in the tech industry, um, but a long, long time ago. And I spent about 10 years working on support and then infrastructure projects. Uh, then I got into IT service management and then a branch of IT service management, which is service improvement. Ran a service improvement project where I needed a product owner and I didn't have budget one, so budget for one, so I became a scrum product owner for a little while. And from there I ended up in product management and I've been a product leader for about five years, so I am totally an infiltrator. Um, and I started with this quote from Michael Dell. Um, never try, try to never be the smartest person in the room. If you are, I suggest you invite smarter people or find a different room. And thinking about um, leading smart people, the thing about smart people is they're a pain in the ass. And I shouldn't say that because clearly I'm in a room of extraordinarily smart people. What I mean is other smart people are a pain in the ass <laughs> because they ask difficult questions and they know lots of things, but they think they know everything and they think they know more than us. And sometimes they do know more than us and that's hard to live with sometimes. But there's another good reason to worry if you're frequently the smartest person in the room because there are two ways to be the smartest person in the room. One is be extraordinarily smart or two is be the kind of person no smart person wants to be in a room with, so don't go there. But on the flip side of that, imagine being the kind of person that smart people really want to be in a room with. How great would that feel and how might we get there? So a leader, by definition, is someone people follow. Um, it's not the job of the leader to tell everyone what to do. Uh, it's the job of the leader to set direction and to inspire people to follow that direction. Um, and not all leaders have line management responsibility, as I'm sure a lot of you know. Um, you don't have to have leader in your job title to be a leader. A good leader is someone people follow, not because they have to, but because they choose to. And if smart people choose to follow you, again, how great is that going to feel? So if I want someone to follow me, I better start by knowing where I'm going. Um, and we do that through vision, right? So vision is about inspiring people. What might be possible in some kind of distant-ish future if everything, if we achieve everything we want to? And um, I love this quote about vision um, from Antoine de Saint-Exupéry. I think I almost managed to say his name right. Um, and he says, if you want to build a ship, don't drum up people to collect wood. Don't assign them tasks and work. Rather, teach them to long for the endless immensity of the sea. I love this. Um, and he's got the vision right there, right? It's that longing for the endless immensity of the sea. He also talks a lot about the tactics, well, talks a little about the tactics, the gathering the wood. Um, and there's something in between that he's missing there, which that's strategy. So that's how you connect the vision of the longing to th for the sea to the daily work of gathering wood and, and whatever else it is to take to build, to build a ship. Um, so I'm going to stretch that analogy probably past its breaking point now. Um, if what he wants to do is create a generation of shipbuilders, it should probably have some kind of strategy. So it might look something like this. 
And you'll notice there's no detail here because we don't have to be the experts in how to set up an apprenticeship scheme because we can find people that have done that before. We can find people that are experts in passing on the skills of, of the experienced shipbuilders to, to the new generation coming through. Uh, we don't have to know how you build a dockyard. We can hire somebody who knows how to build a dockyard, those sorts of things. So these are just the high level steps that should get us there. But a good strategy should help us decide what to do and also what not to do. And if you ever find yourself reading a strategy document and you can't think of a single thing in your business that somebody might propose that that strategy would rule out, that's very often a warning sign. Strategy should be able to tell you what not to do as well as what to do. So, for example, um, if some leader starts getting very excited about the idea of, build, uh, of setting up a navigation school, we can say, well, hold on a sec, we're just focused on shipbuilding. We're not thinking about the skills it takes to crew the ship yet we might realise, oh wow, there's no demand for ships because nobody has the skills to crew a ship. And we might realise we need to split our investment or maybe we need to pivot our investment. And that could be a strategic change. Your strategy should be stable, but it shouldn't be set in stone. It should be able to change if you realise it's wrong. At the same time, it shouldn't be fluid. If we realise, actually, no, no, it's fine. There's, there, there are sailors, there are navigators, it's, it's fine. That's taken care of. We're, we're focusing on the shipbuilding. We know we can say no to the idea of a navigation school or a culinary school for ship's cooks or whatever it is. Um, so your strategy needs to be stable, not rigid, but also not fluid. And it needs to serve you. If, if the strategy is getting you to do things that don't feel right, then that's the time to challenge it. And I'm also going to mention right now, getting the rest, whether it's a departmental strategy or a whole business strategy, it's important to get the people around you bought into that strategy, partly because it helps you communicate the kind of things they should expect from you and the kind of things they shouldn't expect from you, and also because it's going to come in handy later, and we'll come to that in a bit. Um, vision and strategy aren't just for what you're going to do, depending on your role very much, but in general, as a leader, people need to feel inspired and connected to how we're going to do it. Things like ways of working, culture, team norms. People are looking to leaders for direction there. And there are whole books, conference talks, based on just how, how to do that. But I'm going to really quickly touch on some of the ingredients. Um, so first off, telling people. You'll hear people say a lot, show, don't tell. But telling is actually important as well. Because telling is where you get to explain things and where you get to connect things to the other work you're doing. So let's say, for example, my way of working that I want to encourage is I want people to be more collaborative across teams. And if I can explain why that's important and what went wrong when we, weren't, when we don't do that, um, that's, that's something that's much harder to show. So the, the telling is important, but yes, it's not as powerful as showing. So showing is by um, calling out examples of when it's worked well, when it hasn't worked well, uh, making sure we lift up and, and raise up the, the times when, um, when, it's ha when what we want to see is happening, make, make good examples of those. And also by modeling those behaviors ourselves. If we want to build trust and this not just be a bunch of words we're saying, we have to be able to model that and show and tell people, hey, I'm making sure I work much, much closer with the sales team because I realize we're missing huge opportunities by not being close enough to those folks. And if you're trying to do anything consistently, you're human, you will screw up, screw up so own it. Um, and this is actually more powerful than any of the others put together as a leader is when you can say, do you know what? We just had this misunderstanding that cost us a bunch of work because I should have talked to the sales team earlier. And I've been telling all of you how important it is to collaborate across teams, and I didn't talk to them. And I realized that, and next time I'm going to bring them right in at the start because I've learned my lesson. And being able to be vulnerable, but also being shown it's all right to try and get it wrong because you're going to try and do better next time. So if you're familiar with Dan Pink and his book Drive or his TED Talk, you'll recognize these three words. If not, I've got a QR code later, <laughs> which may or may not work on this screen, but it, he's easy enough to find. It's not hard. Um, but these are the conditions he talks about for intrinsic motivation. So extrinsic motivation is, um, well done, here's your salary. Well done, you've got a pat on the head. Uh, well done, here's a gold star. Well done, you've been promoted. Intrinsic motivation is the stuff that gets you out of bed in the morning and excited to get out of bed, not, not oh, I've got to do this because otherwise I won't get paid. It's the intrinsic motivation is, oh, I think I might know how to solve that problem and I think I might be able to do it today. Oh, I'm really excited to be running this workshop today. I think we might actually make some really good progress. That's intrinsic motivation. And the ingredients that he talks about are autonomy, mastery and purpose. But thinking about it another way, if you're working with smart people, why would you hire smart people and not give them these things? Why would you hire smart people and tell them what to do all the time? 
and not let them use their own smarts to work things out? Why would you not want them to continue developing their skills and being smart and bouncing off each other and sharing skills and teaching each other? And why would you not want to give them a sense of purpose so that they feel aligned with the direction you're pulling in? So we've talked about vision and strategy. Hopefully that should align people around a sense of purpose. So that's one of these things ticked off already. So that's great. Um, and even if you have line management authority, getting people to do things because I'm your manager and I've told you to, that's your absolute last resort. That's, that's the last place you go, ideally. Um, so what do you need in order to get people to want to follow you? Usually it's respect, right? Leadership requires permission, and you get that. It's, it's hard to get that permission if you don't have people's respect. There should be a baseline amount of respect and trust that everybody gets, but one of the things you can do to really supercharge that is when you can visibly add value quickly. And one of the f ways I've found that I can most visibly add value to a team, working closely with them, is by unlocking the knowledge of the team. It's by helping them get, into get to answers that they didn't know they knew, and that's through coaching. And I realize there's a lot of coaches in the room. Clearly, there's a lot more to coaching than what I'm going to talk about, but these are things that anyone can do at any time. Um, when you're the smartest person in the room, you can help people get to the right answer because you know what the right answer is. And you might do it in what feels like a coachy kind of way where you're leading them there, but you still, you're still leading them towards your answer. But what if you, what if you don't know the answer? Um, what if they've got a better answer? What if you think you know the answer and they've got a better answer? By coaching, you can get teams to answer they don't know they're capable of, and you don't need to know the answer yourself either. And when it works well, it's like magic. Um, I remember I, uh, I was put in as a product manager with a team who had some knotty problem to work out. And I'd been in the organization two days. I didn't understand their product. It wasn't something that you could just pick up instantly. It took a bit of understanding. But because I was able to ask them a bunch of questions and lead them through explaining to me why the decision was hard to make, through the process of ask, asking those kinds of questions, Halfway through, they realised they knew the answer. And, and they're kind of like, oh, oh, we do know this. And I sort of walked off going, ha, 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 my work here is done. <laughs> and that was on day two of a new job, which doesn't happen that often, but that was particularly lovely, which is why it sticks in my mind, obviously. Um, and it might not be in your job description. There might be somebody else who has coach in their title. Um, it, it, there might even be somebody in the team who has coach as their title. But coaching can come from more than one place. Ideally, it comes from everyone. And I was lucky enough to work in a place where all the line managers all got trained in some basic coaching techniques. And what they taught us was the second most important part of coaching is asking powerful questions. And I'll come to the first in a little bit. I'm going to give you some examples of powerful questions. And you're probably doing some of this already. So, for example, can we solve part of the problem sooner and then do more later? So this is a classic agile coaching question, right? Can we sequence the work in such a way we deliver value early and it doesn't come all in one big lump at the end like in the old days? Um, do we know what good looks like and do we know what good enough looks like? Lovely question um, to have as an open discussion with a team because it can thrash out some of the things that might have become gold plating, that might have delayed you from doing that releasing sooner. Um, or maybe, actually, there is, there is, kind, there is a quality bar here. We don't, we don't want to release too early. We, we do actually care about making this good enough. But getting that out in the open and getting the whole team's understanding, much better to do that before the work starts than once somebody's got really attached to their thing that they think is super important for that first release that nobody else really thinks is that important. Um, what do we know already and what if we're wrong? Um, this is a really good one when you're in a team who are kind of spinning their wheels on a problem. Uh, I've used it in the middle of um, an incident when we didn't know the cause of the incident and particularly when you work remotely. Um, I've found that if you work on an incident remotely when you've not been used to it, it's really easy for somebody to go down the rabbit hole on their own and become really hard to communicate with. And I found that having half hourly situation reports um, was a massively useful thing. So we said, right, at half seven, we're going we're gonna to break for five minutes and just do a quick check-in on where we are. And being able to ask this, what things do we know? What things do we think we know? And of the things we think we know, are there any in there that we might be heading in completely the wrong direction if we're wrong and actually we're not that confident? Because that can uncover, oh, actually, yeah, that's the next thing we need to explore. My favourite estimating question, two days, is that assuming everything works first time. And then the follow-up question is, and when was the last time you had two uninterrupted days <laughs> during which everything worked first time? <laughs> and suddenly the answer's eight days. <laughs> 
Um, and this is the most important part, part of coaching. I said that powerful questions were the second most, and the most important part is listening, because powerful questions are only powerful in the right context. And it's not just about context in terms of what people are saying. It's, and again, this, this gets a little bit harder remotely. You have to be a little bit more explicit in asking, in, in checking in on these things. But how's the energy level? Is now a good time to be doing your deepest probing? Or actually, do the team just need to be left some space to do their thing and build their, build their own confidence and get their mojo back, you know? Um, so knowing when to challenge, when to trust them, when to let them get on with it, these are all critical things. So... Dan Pink mostly talks about individual mastery, um, but what you bring by asking powerful questions in a team setting is a kind of team mastery. By getting people to unlock, by, by unlocking the knowledge of the team, um, they, they build a confidence because they're solving problems they didn't know they knew how to solve, which is a lovely thing. You'll also find that you're modeling a behavior which they will start to pick up and they will start to ask each other similar questions, which is a beautiful thing. Um, I have a friend who describes effective leadership as winning when you're not in the room and I love that phrase because if you've ever had it happen it's the most beautiful thing um, you come into a room with a team that you've been working with and you see them doing the thing that you, that you see them asking each other these kinds of powerful questions and you're like oh that's beautiful absolutely lovely thing the most satisfying thing as a leader um, so the team will grow those skills and also you're growing your own skills you're you're also growing those skills as a coach so we've ticked off mastery um, so what's next? So let's imagine your team has been asked to solve some problem for your user, and there might be a few different ways to solve it. Uh, what if there's a few options and none of them are really the best answer? Obviously, um, none of them are obviously the best answer. As a leader, it's great if you can coach them through figuring that out, but you're not in the room all the time very often. You can't be in every conversation. And it might be tempting to say, well, I want to give them as much autonomy as I can. I, I want them to say, you do it however you think you should. And if you work in an extraordinarily high trust environment, first congratulations, and that, that might work. Very often, even when you're trying to create those kind of high trust environments, it takes a long, long time for people to really feel that trust. And it feels like a trap. Um, so you don't want the team to be blocked waiting for you to work through every request with them in detail. But you also don't want them to charge off in the wrong direction. And more to the point, they don't want to risk charging off in the wrong direction. So even if we don't know what a solution should be, we can probably say what are some characteristics of a good solution or a not good solution. Um, and a common understanding of those can take away some of that fear. And we do that by setting a set of principles. Sorry, Dan. <laughs> um, so when do you need a set of principles for your team? Um, chances are you already have loads of them, and some of them might be so obvious you don't need to write them down. Um, but some of them aren't explicit, and maybe even if everybody does kind of know them, new people to your team might take a while to pick them up. Or if you ever have to work with other teams and these things aren't known, that might be unhelpful. So if there's an opportunity for misunderstandings to creep in, write them down. And also writing down forces us to be clear about things. It, it forces us to be precise with our language a little bit more than we might if, it, if it's just kind of a... Um, uh, a thing that we hold internally. So um, where you don't know or where you're not sure you know what those principles are, that's where the fear sets in and that's what we're trying to avoid by making them explicit. So for example, quite a common um, principle in B2B organisations is API first. Um, I worked at eBay, we had a big business community selling on eBay, we had a big developer community and it made sense for us that anything we did on the seller platform we also had to be able to do in the API. Um, and we used to develop it first for the API and then build the front end. Um, and for us, that was really useful because it helped us with prioritization. It kind of helped us defend the API a little bit um, if people were getting a bit carried away in the rest of the organization. Um, this is one that I learned from some product designers. Um, if you, they, they had some quite junior product designers who were really, really keen to prove themselves and be the most innovative all the time. But not every product experience benefits from being the most innovative. If you're running uh, an e-commerce website and how much in, you know, in an online store, how much advantage is there to be had by having the most innovative or beautiful checkout experience? You don't want it to be awful, but there's also not much to be gained by making it 10% better. Whereas if you're running uh, an online store, there are lots of other places that beautiful design and really good design is going to massively make a difference. So innovate where it's going to add value for you. Um, 
often a principle comes out in response to something that happened. So this one was um, in an organisation I worked in where we had a particular focus on a particular metric and we realised it would be really easy to make all the dashboards look green by actually not doing any of the things that the metric was designed to get us to do in the first place. So we made it really clear that we would rather have a red dashboard than do the wrong things to create a green dashboard and we would defend the team's red dashboard and we would go to meetings and say, yeah, here's why it's red and here's why we're happy about that. Maybe not happy, but you know. Um, and sometimes they're specific to your product. So this was a product that I worked on uh, where we had a configuration management system back in the day when you tended to own your devices and your physical networks. And we needed to be able to potentially push out an emergency configuration change to about 200,000 devices that we owned on networks that we owned. And we didn't want to flood the network. So we designed it from the ground up, optimizing for small payload. And any time we made a change, if there were two ways to do it, and one of them had a smaller payload, that's the one we'd choose. So very often, you, you come up with specific principles that, that make sense for your product because of the things that you need to optimize for. So how do you create principles? Well, first off, which questions tend to come up again and again? When someone's new to the team, what's, what takes them a little while to learn? Or what do you spend your time spinning your wheels on and it takes you a while to come to a decision and, and agree that actually, yeah, the right way to do it is this? And as a team, when we sit down and discuss it, is there clearly a better choice? If not, does it matter? If not, choose some other way. Um, and I flippantly put a coin toss on here. Actually, go for the simplest one that you're most confident you can deliver quickly because time to value probably trumps most other factors in that situation. But if, you don't, if it does matter, if actually there's two ways we could do this and one might be brilliant and the other might be massively risky but we don't know, um, then yeah, you're going to have to do some more exploration there. That might be research, it might be safe to fail experiments, it might be a commercial decision, you know, are we optimising for user A or user B? Actually, we don't know. We don't know which user persona we think is going to help us most grow this year. Um, we're we're going to need to talk to somebody else in the organisation. That might be one way some more direction is needed. But you get to a point where you know, you, you've decided, okay, actually, these things generally are going to be good for us and these things are generally going to be less good for us. So articulate what's better about the better choices. And it's going to go in one of two places. If it's about the direction you're headed in, probably belongs in your strategy, add it to your strategy, job done. If it doesn't belong in your strategy, if it's more about how you're going to get there or what you're going to optimise for along the way, figure out how to word it as a principle, put it on the wall, have a biscuit, well done. And for anybody who wants it, there's that all on one page. <laughs> so, we've covered autonomy because setting a set of principles gives teams autonomy to use their expertise and gives you the confidence that a solution they choose will be probably a good one. But more importantly, gives them the confidence that they understand what good looks like in as much as you do. And that's true even if you don't know what that solution is. But the most common thing people are thinking at this point, they tell me is, but we don't get autonomy. The rest of the business tells us what to do. And there are ways that you can improve that. And your goal is to be a trusted partner. If you're an order taker for your organization, if you tend to be told what to build, when to build it by, that's not helpful. And it's also not compatible with having a strategy of your own. Because if the customer who shouts loudest is determining your roadmap, you're building on their strategy, not yours. So remember I said, Getting people excited about your strategy is really important. That's one of the tools that you can use at this point. Um, so being a trusted partner. When you think about a successful partnership, whether it's in personal relationships, whether it's a sporting partnership, a business partnership, it doesn't tend to involve one person ordering the other around. It's usually... Um, a situation where people are, they know each other deeply. They know how to communicate just enough to each other. Um, they know, they have deep understanding and rapport and they trust each other. They know that they, they have each other's interests at heart. They're not going to throw each other under the bus. And clearly it's much easier said than done. So I'm going to give some suggestions based on what's worked for me in the past. So the first is don't build things, solve problems, which is again, really easy to say. And of course we build things, but by talking more about the problems we solve than the things we build, we can get ourselves out of this trap. Um, my least favorite request in the world is I need a dashboard. Don't even get me, every time, every time somebody says the word dashboard, reflexively I say, don't even get me started about dashboards. But every request for a dashboard is a, usually involves a real need. And somebody wants to be able to take action 
based on something they see on the dashboard. So what do they want to see that's going to prompt them to take action and how is that going to make the world a better place? There are occasions where people just want to see a green dashboard because it feels reassuring to them, in which case I suggest get them a landscape painting, which is also green and also relaxing and a lot cheaper. <laughs> but, um, but let's say in this case somebody wants to know in advance when they should add capacity to their platform. There are lots of ways you can do that that aren't the dashboard and maybe some of them are quicker and cheaper and maybe even better than the dashboard. Um, everything is a trade-off. Uh, if I've got any product people in here, we all know about this. This is basically our lives, trading things off against each other. But you might as well be honest about it. Uh, I worked with a really smart senior leader quite early in my career, and we were talking about slippage on a project. And he said, I don't want you to use that word because it's a choice that we're delivering late. It didn't happen accidentally. And we're choosing to deliver late because we, we prefer that risk to the risk of releasing something incomplete or releasing something of low quality. So this is a considered decision that we've made. And obviously, having that conversation the day before you think you're going to release it, probably not helpful. But the earlier you can start having those conversations with your stakeholders, which is, well, actually, we could deliver on time, but we don't think it's acceptable to deliver with less functionality than we promised. Somebody might say, oh, no, no, that's fine. The date's really important because there's an industry event and we expect our competitors probably going to have a big announcement on that date. So we need to get in there with something before they announce it. And actually, if it's half finished, that's probably fine. That might be okay. So don't assume. Have those conversations. Have them out in the open. Um, and strategy. This is, this is what we were saying before. Um, this is one of the trade-offs. Strategy helps you decide what to do and what not to do. So if you are constantly doing things which don't take you in the direction of your strategy, when do you get to do all the things, that, all the lovely things that people got excited about in your strategy and your vision? Um, and any time you take on new work that takes you away from your strategy, obviously it's delaying you achieving the things in your strategy. That doesn't mean you never do it. It's like tech debt. You take on tech debt consciously because that's the right thing to do in that moment. And similarly, you can choose to take on strategic debt. It may be that actually, do you know what? If we do this thing that it's not going to completely derail our strategy, but it's not aligned with it, but a customer is going to pay us a huge amount of money. Um, and the, the amount of money they're willing to pay us is, is actually enough that we're okay with delaying our strategy by six months. Then, okay, that, that might well be worth it, but that's a choice you're making. It's not a thing you're accidentally doing. Um, and you know the same as tech debt. If all you ever do is accrue strategic debt, you never get back to your strategy. If all you ever do is accrue tech debt, you end up with a platform that you can't do anything in anymore. Uh, and finally, don't measure the thing, measure the benefit. And this is less about measurement and more about how we talk about things. But if we're thinking about solving problems rather than building things, and if the language of our business is how much of the thing have you built, oh, well, I'm 35% this week. Oh, that's, that's, you said you were 30% last week. That, that's not a helpful conversation. Whereas if we can talk about our progress on solving a problem um, and on achieving an outcome, that's much more helpful. And unsurprisingly to most people in this room, that means OKRs. Um, you do not have to have a beautiful set of OKRs that come down like a tr Christmas tree all through your organisation for this to work. You can do this in one team. You can do this anywhere. And if OKRs is kind of a loaded term in your organisation, call them something else. Call them um, objectives, goals and indicators because they're indicators more than the results anyway. So, um, so uh, yeah, it's, it's not really about measuring. It is about measuring, but for the purposes of what I'm talking about today, it's about focusing on what's important. And the magic is when you co-create them with the people who you most need to keep happy in your organisation. So um, let's say somebody comes to us with a requirement. <gasps> I want a customer request status portal. Um, and good looks like you've delivered it on time and on budget. Those lovely words that we all love to hear so much. And uh, let's say the immediate problem, what problem are we solving here? We can ask, right? That's, that's not a rude question. What problem are we solving here? And let's say the immediate problem is customers don't know where the requests are at. They're not happy about it. And they keep, call, they keep contacting our contact center. And we're expecting some seasonal variation in load on that contact center. And actually, if we don't do something about this, we might need to hire some temporary staff to supplement the contact center that we don't have any budget for. That's a problem we can get behind solving, right? So we might respond with, so you're saying you want the number of contacts for request status to come down. 
and our stakeholder says, yeah, yeah, I think so, yeah. So we'll sit down with them and we'll, we'll, we'll get them to help propose some OKRs. So we'll write an objective of customers know the status of their request. And the key results, the contacts for request status specifically come down by 80% by the end of the quarter and customers are going to be happy, so CSAT will go up. And we can probe a little bit more and say, well, would solving part of the problem sooner be helpful? And actually, when we, when we probe a little bit, it turns out, do you know what, actually, there's something happening in about six weeks' time. There's a new service coming online. And if we could just reduce the, the, the capacity this is taking up a little bit in the next six weeks, that would make a big difference. And I might not need to bring in any temporary help at all. I might not even need to have people work overtime. Um, so, okay, objective stays the same. This time we're going to change our key results a bit. Contact for request status down. We think we can bring it down 20% because if we focus on just a couple of request types to begin with, we think that might actually be 20% of the, the whole capacity overall. Um, and we'll go for 60% by the end of the quarter because we're sequencing our work a bit different. So it's not the fastest path, but it is the f it's not the fastest path to the end goal, but it's the fastest path to early value. And while we do expect customer satisfaction to improve, if we make that a goal, then we're going to be trying to do things that are going to be brilliant. And actually, what, right now, we'd be happy just for customer satisfaction not to get worse. And once we start doing this, we'll very quickly find out what customers think of it, and we'll be better informed to do the things that do make customers happy. And we've got away from talking about the thing, which was what we were originally asked for, customer request status pool. And we started talking more about the benefit, what we're actually going to do. And nowhere in the benefit does it say we have to build a portal. We might do this through better email updates. Um, could turn out that the reason they're calling is because we're formatting our emails really badly and they're getting caught in everyone's spam fi filter. Or actually, they're so hard to read, people aren't realizing it's an update at all. Maybe we could just improve the email updates. There might be a whole bunch of, we've, we've, we've got their mobile numbers. Maybe we could update them by text message if they're more likely to read that. There are a whole bunch of ways we could make this improvement that might not necessarily involve building that portal at all. So to recap, we started out talking about how we can't always be the smartest person in the room, and nor should we try, um, because we're a leader when people choose to follow us. And we get there by inspiring purpose through vision and strategy. Ooh. By building mastery with our teams and with each, uh, so that they can help each other by asking powerful questions and hopefully by us modeling that, they start to ask powerful questions of each other as well. By giving autonomy with confidence, by sharing principles so people know that they're probably, they, they can be confident they're probably heading in a good direction. And we get autonomy by building partnership by talking about the benefits, not the thing. So um, all of this has been built on the three principles that um, Dan Pink talked about. Ooh, that QR code might actually work. If you're not already familiar, that's where you can find his TED Talk. It's quite old now. Um, if not, just search Dan Pink TED Talk. It's not hard to find. But thank you very much.